Welcome to today's PDAC webinar, Managing Employees in a Post-COVID-19 Environment, which is the ninth of 16 sessions in the FASCN series. My name is Virginia Schweitzer, and I am the co-managing partner of FASCN's Ottawa office and a member of the PDAC program committee. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. At the end of the webinar, please click the survey link underneath the video to fill out the survey. Your input is greatly appreciated. During the webinar, if you have questions, please type your question into the chat box beside the video. Today's panel will do their best to answer all the questions they can. If you require technical support, please click the tech FAQs or tech support chat, which is located under the question chat box. The slides and speaker bios from today's webinar can be accessed from the materials button underneath the video player. The, this webinar is also being broadcast on YouTube Live. And now I will turn things over to Alex Herber, who is a senior partner in the Labour, Employment and Human Rights Group in our Toronto office. Thanks, Virginia. Welcome everyone to our presentation today on managing employees in the post-COVID-19 environment. As Virginia said, I'm in the Toronto office I've been a partner at the firm for 20 years, and I'm joined today by three of my fantastic partners, Stefan Fillion from our Montreal office, Andrew Dixon from our Calgary office, and Paul Fuge from our Johannesburg office. Today, we're gonna to focus our discussion on the new reality of work arising out of the current pandemic. We also have a wealth of knowledge relating to COVID, which can be found at our COVID-19 Knowledge Center on our website at www.baskin. Com. Our session today will start with the current realities of work, what the pandemic has taught us a year in, and what some of the thoughts are about the future of work. Stefan will then discuss the ins and outs of working remotely, as well as managing performance in this new work environment. Some unique issues with new video conference, the new video conference world. We are lucky so far that none of us today have had to say, I am alive, I am not a cat. So hopefully you can all see us clearly. Andrew will then discuss the particular impact of COVID on family status accommodation and on terminations during a pandemic. Paul will jump in on each section to provide the South African context, which I for one am looking forward to hearing. For those of you who are wondering where my accent is from, I am South African by birth, but I never practiced there. So I have a particular love of learning all I can about my homeland. Looking forward to Paul's uh, input today. We will end today's session on vaccines, the top five issues we think will be front of mind for employers. Next slide. We'll start with the new reality of work. Next slide, please. One year ago, only a fraction of the Canadian workers worked from home. So it's a good time to reflect and pause as we think about what it's been like a year in and start thinking about our future forecast of what the models will be for how we will plan our workforce in the post-COVID world. So a year prior, only a fraction of the Canadian workforce were working from home or remotely. So for some cases, employees would negotiate working from home at the beginning of their employment or have some combination of working from home and at the office as a result of the particular nature of their work. And we've obviously seen the increase of the use of, of hoteling as a form of setting up a work environment. We would also get requests to accommodate employees to allow them to work from home where they were underlying disabilities that required it or family status accommodations. But overall, my impression has been that employers did not permit work from home arrangements unless actually required to do for human rights reasons or where it's really what made sense for the nature of the work. And I believe that most employees were hesitant to allow employees to work from home because they were worried about performance issues or productivity issues. And so a year later, I think it's a good opportunity to think about some of the benefits and negatives that have come from working remotely with respect to workflow and performance. And I think the old thinking of whether to allow work from home arrangements must take into account what we've learned over the past year. Next slide, please. So whereas in the past, you know, typically it was the employer's discretion or something negotiated with the employee to allow them to work from home. 
Interesting, as, a, as the pandemic has gone along, there are now requirements in certain provinces, and I'll get into that in a minute, that actually require employees to work from home if the nature of the work permits it. So employees have been working from home a lot over the last year, and many see it as a viable op option for moving forward. So the old position of we just can't allow work from home arrangements may no longer be practical or acceptable to employees. In fact, I think there's now an expectation that employers will consider such re uh, requests, especially if they have worked well or successfully over the past year. An interesting issue has also arisen with a number of my clients recently where some employees have relocated to other provinces or locations to work remotely. In fact, some have done so without even advising their employer that they have chosen to do so. In fact, I've seen recent ads in Nova Scotia where there is a government initi initiative to get at least 10,000 employees to move to Nova Scotia to uh, work remotely from that province. Given that they have very low COVID um, numbers, this may be attractive to many employees who are connected to that province. So when we think about employees either choosing to move to another location with or without the consent of their employer, there are implications that may arise from a tax perspective, but also from an employment standards perspective. I can speak about Ontario where, for example, the employment standards law says that the Ontario employment standards law will govern all the minimum requirements like hours of work, overtime, minimum wage, et cetera. But it'll also capture work done remotely if that work is a continuation of the work the employees did in Ontario. So if an employee chose to move to Nova Scotia, it could be that Ontario employment standards law would apply. But interestingly enough, it's also possible that Nova Scotia law will apply with respect to employment standards. So we will see some jurisdictional conflicts if there are claims that arise in a jurisdiction where the employee was not initially hired and was not initially working. So definitely something to consider moving forward. Next slide, please. I thought at this point, it would be interesting to have some statistics to kind of show where we are from a Canadian perspective. So before the pandemic, about four in 10 jobs were capable of being carried out from home. So that's almost 38.9% of the work was capable of being performed remotely. As of the end of March, 2020, so just as uh, the pandemic was um, hitting us, about 39.1% of employees were working remotely. So there was obviously an overnight shift because prior to that, 10 to 13% of work was actually done remotely. So there was clearly a huge number of jobs that were able to be done remotely that were not being done remotely. We've also seen in the statistics that there are many more jobs that women have that can be done remotely as opposed for men job, for, for jobs that men perform. And this is obviously based on the industries and occupations uh, that people have. So obviously for men and women working in different jobs, male dominated jobs such as mining or in agriculture or construction typically can't be performed from home. Whereas jobs in the finance, insurance, education and professional industries are capable of being done at home. We've also seen some of our provinces have lower remote work capacity where workers are working mainly in the areas of mining, oil and gas extraction. And that was in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland. So we've obviously seen a big shift in the work from home. So if we move to the next slide, we will see that from the employee perspective, we've also seen a change in attitude. And there have been two recent studies that came out um, at the end of last year. So the ADP study, which was in September 2020, indicates that 45% of Canadians would prefer to work remotely at least three days a week. And at least 25% of Canadians would prefer more flexible work hours. And over half of the, um, those employees surveyed, so 55%, say that their employer has continued to allow remote and flexible work during the pandemic. So there's a clear desire on the employee side to embrace flexible work options beyond the pandemic. But flexibility does not always equate to compensation. And that's what I found interesting in the study, which was 69% of respondents were not willing to accept reduced compensation for the changes, which prior to the pandemic was sometimes seen as a perk. Moreover, 4% of workers said they would consider, would not said they would consider a reduced compensation to work reduced hours, for example, four day week. 
So interesting enough, I've seen a number of articles in recent times saying employers may want to offer four day work weeks or re at reduced compensation and allow employees to work remotely as an opportunity to maybe get, you know, reduce the productivity loss that some employees may think they're experiencing. But this study shows that most employees are not interested in having that compensation reduction. So obviously what that study shows to me is that employers may have an opportunity to embrace more flexibility with their employees, uh, create more engagement, retention, and performance through these remote work um, arrangements. The other thing in the study that I think um, I'll, you know, the attendees would be interested in hearing is sort of the anxiety around the return to work. And what I've seen in the study is that most employees still have a high level of anxiety about returning to the work environment. Notwithstanding that 84% of those employees in this ADP survey thought that their employer had done a good job in establishing precaution to reduce the, the spread of COVID-19 be it cleaning, measures, sanitation, physical distancing, mask wearing, protective barriers, et cetera. But obviously, if you're going to be bringing employees back to work, reducing this, this anxiety will require them to mitigate it by having clear expectations set up, providing policies and advising employees clearly in communications what measures have been put into place in the work environment. The second study is the RBC study which again is from the employee side. And this shows that 63% of Canadians want at least a 50-50 split of office and remote work. Interestingly, in the same study, among those organizations that can consider remote work environments, only 30% of those companies were likely or very likely to do so post pandemic. So what I think we can say right now is that the work from home model is here to stay to some extent, and definitely for some employees. And so with many employees wanting to work remotely and experience showing that it may very well work for some companies, um, there may be an opportunity for companies to create these remote and flexible work arrangements. In fact, they may feel some pressure to do so, especially if they're competing for highly skilled and mobile workers. Next slide, please. To start the legal framework, I thought it's just interesting to reflect on where we are now. So currently, we obviously have some jurisdictions that are mandating remote work um, unless attendance is required by the nature of the work. And we obviously have many other jurisdictions that are just encouraging remote work as a way to reduce the spread of COVID-19. So Ontario currently has a stay-at-home order in effect. This is supposed to expire on Monday. Uh, we're supposed to get some news today as to what's happening in Ontario. And there's some mixed reviews about whether we should be opening things up or whether the restrictions should be cautiously opened up to continue to keep um, the COVID-19 spread down, especially with the variants becoming um, more increasingly a concern from the medical perspective. Alberta also has a public order that requires employees work um, from home unless in-person work is required to effectively operate the workplace. Next slide. And obviously Quebec has a similar one where um, employees in presence must be essential to the continuation of the activities of the company for them to be attending at work. So basically in short, what, we, what we're seeing here is that there, these um, requirements are quite broad. It really requires the employer to do an analysis of whether the work actually requires them to be at work um, or not. Um, certainly what I found is a pressure on employers is that if you were able to allow employees to work from home during the initial stages of the pandemic, you're going to be hard pressed now to continue um, to continue um, saying that that's not a requirement, that it's that it is a requirement that they attend at the work environment. Over to Paul. So I thought a good place to start is to mention that South Africa is still a long way away from talking about a post-COVID environment. It will take a long time to get the vaccine to a sufficiently large part of the population. Um, so we expect it to, to be managed under what we call the Disaster Management Act for, for some time to come. It means that the five levels, as with most country, will remain in place. Um, 
it it could be more than a year. It could even be two two years. We think before we are beyond that, um, and that's the place to start. In short, under levels four and five, and our government has opted for variations within each level. It's not as easy as to say these are the rules, but under law, levels four or five, which is the most severe levels of lockdown, you will find that. Working um, at home is really the only option. Um, it, it's not compelling to, or you're not compelled to do so, but it is your only option. Under levels one to three, um, the government encourage working from home and the employer has a discretion as to the degree to which employees will be working from home or not. But there are strict rules regarding health and safety, um, and what you need to do in order to prepare your building, um, also rules around uh, sanit sanitizing and social distancing. And most employers have been very slow, obviously, especially in the services industry, um, to, to go back to work. There's large parts of that, that part of our workforce that is, is not back at work. We do not expect to return to levels four and five soon. Our government, even now during level two, when the numbers were worse than during uh, the first wave, um, our government did not go back to levels four or five. So we do expect to, even if there's a third wave, to be at levels one, two, three. Um, we think the third wave is inevitable. Uh, it means employers will have a discretion as to whether we work from home or not. And what we expect in the next two, it could even be three years, is a gradual return to work for those workers that have been working at, at home um, at the discretion of the employers. Of course, maybe one interesting thing is that there's a, there's a clear saving linked to employees working from home, and that could be driving the decisions in this respect. And that's really the snapshot of South Africa in respect of whether we are compelled to work at home. Next slide, please. So the next topic we want to talk about is what you need to know. Next slide, please. If we start with South Africa, um, COVID has had a profound effect. We've really been catapulted into, I suppose, what one could call the fourth industrial revolution. Um, we are probably, in terms of remote work, now dealing with a situation we may only arrive at in 10 or 15 years' time, and it's brought legally, practically, lots of questions to employers. I don't think they are unique, maybe some of them, to give you some examples. Obviously, now the part of the home has become really part of the office. It brings questions about privacy, confidentiality, security, and, and the like. Um, the employer has to be thinking about um, inadvertently imposing on the privacy of the, of the employee when it contacts the employee. Uh, the issue of confidentiality has become, or confidential information has become a major issue thinking about uh, what the employee has at home, what the employee should be allowed at home. Uh, of course, taking laptops home is not a new thing, but now we're also talking about hard copies. Uh, employees in the services industry needs to think about whether you allow employees to print at home, for example. Yeah, some of our clients have had to deal with giving technology to employees who've never taken technology home. And in areas in our country, we have high uh, crime uh, and you need to think about security, um, not only confidentiality in that respect. So those are the kind of questions we've had to, to, to think about. Also, um, how does it impact on policies and procedures um, for employers? Um, many of our employers or for, of our clients have been wanting to implement unique measures seeing COVID as this major uh, interruption and being under the Disaster Management Act, justifying certain changes to, to rules and policies. And we've had to bring them back to the basics. 
uh, what are the basic rules in, in changing policies? What are the basic rules if you want to change terms and conditions of employment? And those rules have not changed. It's required them to go back to their policies and procedures and think where the current reality require change. Um, employees that, that are alone at home, for example, have required some special attention. It's certainly increase the employer's attention to employee assistance and access to such assistance programs. Health and safety, health and safety sits at the center of all of this. Um, and it's not only about health and safety at the office. Uh, most of our employers have not really yet caught on to it, but it does require risk assessments in respect of the environment in which the employee works at home. And then finally, compelling employees. We've had some very interesting cases. The time doesn't allow to discuss them all, but it really is about vulnerable and, and comorbid employees. Um, and there again, we had to caution clients to to go to the basics. Uh, does the employee have a sufficient reason um, linked to that? Um, is it possible to accommodate the employee? And it's only once it's not possible to accommodate the employee that um, maybe the employer can, can take steps. But in most cases, we have experienced that accommodating employees in these situations, those who do not want to return to work, has been has been possible. And that is it for South Africa in terms of making your, uh, your home the new reality office. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so I'll take it from there. So coming back to Canada, one of the issue with remote work has been health and safety. Uh, for instance, controlling the health and safety risk is much harder, obviously, when employees are working from home, by definition, all in their own environment, some better than others, as, as we have seen during the crisis. But that doesn't mean that employers should do nothing. As in normal workplaces, you can always do better when it comes to uh, health and safety. Um, it's certainly a good time to start reviewing your policies and procedures and to address hazards and concerns, just like you would do in the workplace, but obviously adapting them. This is kind of the main topic of the conversation on this issue, adapting. Uh, and obviously, as you do that, you need to keep in mind that it's, we're not just addressing the current situation of the pandemic where, you know, as we have seen through, uh, throughout the crisis, Employers have been given more and more leeway because this was kind of an unpredictable situation. But start thinking about what's the future, what's going to be the reality after the pandemic when it comes to uh, remote work. Because as Alex said at the beginning, you know, we've, it's, we've probably haven't seen the end of it. And, you know, and obviously it's probably going to be the reality of tomorrow. So how do you control the safety of the workplace when employees are working from home? One of the uh, solutions that we've come up with is, has been safety checklists that employees uh, have to do themselves. Um, issues that can be covered. Uh, one of the things is evacuating from the worker's home to a safe location. Obviously, this might sound a bit weird. Actually, when I was preparing my presentation uh, and I told that to my children, they had a good laugh and said, where do you want me to go out? There's only one door. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not the reality. You've probably seen that in, in, your, in your workplaces. I like to say in most cases that you know a lot of health and safety rules are kind of uh, dumb proof. So in other words, we're making sure that we cover everything uh, and this is certainly something that uh, you can think about. Um, other elements that we were mentioning on the slide, slips, trips, and falls, uh, that's another thing that we can put on the checklist. Have you verified? Is this something that you can do to prevent this from happening? After all, this is the health of the employees we're talking about, and this is something we would be covering from if they were working from the standard workplace. Provide for the schedule breaks. This is important, not just, uh, you know, not just for the employee, but also just for the mental health of the employees. So taking breaks throughout the day can be helpful for both physical and mental health. Uh, talking about ergonomics, you know, covering, do you have an adjustable chair? Or have you made sure that all features are uh, adjusted? Uh, if there's no adjustable chair available, can we provide some? Uh, are there any additional support that we can provide? 
specifically provide as an example that employees should avoid working from couches or other soft surfaces as we've seen uh, so many times. Um, also, follow good housekeeping practices to reduce the risk of injuries relating to, you know, again, uh, trips and falls or clutter or storage of heavy or sharp items. In addition to being some a very good safety tip, it might even be a good tip to ensure a longer relationship with your spouse. So in other words, you're kind of working for in both directions. Um, I just want to come back maybe very quickly on ergonomics. Uh, this is something that a lot of employers have, uh, have taken a different approach to. Uh, in some cases, employers have been providing, uh, you know, chairs and desks and things like that. Obviously, this might be uh, costly in the beginning, but at the end, this might prevent injuries and uh, the employer will be better off uh, working with this. Next slide. So I'm going to be focusing the last part of this uh, this section on work from home policy. One of the many questions uh, that are raised uh, about adopting a work from home policy: Should I wait uh, until the pandemic is over to cover the new reality, or should I do it right now? Uh, this is a very good question. Depending on the employer, some want to do it immediately; others prefer to wait to make sure we cover the new reality. But what is important is that you'll have to prepare one for sure. One of the things that we're, uh, you we're kind of losing track of is typically in a, an employment contract, if you were to just suddenly change uh, the workplace location to tell an employee, you know what, this wasn't part of your original employment contract, but from now on, you'll have to provide the workplace because you're gonna be working from home. This would typically be viewed uh, as, as a, a substantial modification of their working conditions. It could even result uh, in, in a constructive dismissal allegation. Obviously we see it now mostly as a privilege, uh, but that has not always been the case. You can also look at it from the other standpoint. What about an employee who's always been working from home since he started working with you? What happens if you're if you if you decide that this is no longer going to be possible? So that's one thing your policy can take care of. Provide that uh, remote work is can be part of your employment contract. Can cover that this is not necessarily guaranteed for the future, that it may change and may change based on many elements because we don't know what the future will be looking like in terms of, as an example, what's going to be the impact of remote work on uh, the, the company culture, on engagement of employees, on a lot of things like that that we kind of took for granted in the past, but that's no longer the reality. So we might find ourselves in a few years saying, you know what? We're going to accommodate remote work, but not five days a week, as an example. So make sure your policy will cover this and will be acknowledged or even better signed by the employees so that they know it's part of their uh, employment contract. A work from home policy is also a good place where we can obviously uh, schedule uh, you know, provide for stuff like uh, working hours, expectations. I'm going to cover that in the uh, performance monitoring uh, section. So I'm going to skip through uh, this aspect, but I wanted to cover a few things. Uh, in terms of childcare arrangements that we're mentioning here, um, this is something that in your policy, you could provide, remind employees that it's their duty to find solutions and to be able to provide a normal, uh, you know, work uh, performance. Um, we're going to cover some part of it in the family status uh, accommodation section that Alex will talk on later, uh, but it's still a good reminder to put it there. Uh, location as well can also be an aspect to cover. Are you going to allow your employees to work from whatever location they want? Uh, what about a country house? What about working from another country? In a recent case, actually, uh, in a university, a professor asked to work from another beautiful location, uh, namely Honolulu in Hawaii. Uh, and actually, the university declined that, saying that, uh, uh, you know, this was not allowed, that he had to be working from his home. The university actually lost because nothing was provided for uh, about this particular subject. And when you think about it, in this particular case, it didn't change anything. So why not allow it, uh, aside from potentially some legal aspect? 
You have to be careful, though, about privacy legislation. This is one thing I never thought about before reading that case, but there could be issues of surrounding the transmission of financial information outside of the country. So be mindful uh, of this uh, particular element. Be mindful as well of, and you've probably seen that numerous times during some Zoom calls, you know, some employees like to work from different locations, but sometimes, unfortunately, the internet is not that great. Uh, so that might be another thing that you'll want to, uh, to cover in addition to the element that I already mentioned. Uh, so let's skip to the next slide. And I'm actually going to skip to the next one I, as well. So work from home, LT and health and safety considerations. I, I think I've already touched on uh, a bit uh, at the beginning. Just maybe one remind, uh, reminder. Although some jurisdiction covers specifically workers' home in the definition of the workplace, while others do not, it does not necessarily change the reality because all uh, you know health and safety legislation cover uh, for general duties at the very least. If you skip to the next slide. So you have the general duties under the OHS legislation to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of, of workers. This is something that can be found throughout the country. And in some areas, you'll even see uh, the workplace being defined as any location where the employee can be asked to perform uh, his work. So that obviously is even uh, broader. What do we do with national employers? Unfortunately, most of the time, the best way to, to handle it will be to develop protocols based on the most stringent requirements uh, so that it could be addressed uh, you know, unilaterally, and not unilaterally, but in the same basis in every uh, provinces. Skip to the next slide. Workers' compensation considerations. Uh, Maybe one, just one element that I wanted to focus on because time is flying is the uh, Toro investigation that's gonna be required. That's one place where we can completely lose control because obviously once an employee, you know, allergies and injury at home, you don't have the same mean that you would have uh, in the workplace. So make sure you establish protocol on gathering information, making sure to get the exact circumstances of the injury, update statements by employees very quickly, uh, provide uh, for an obligation for employees to report injuries immediately so that we can have uh, better uh, fact-finding uh, options. Request photographs for employees. Uh, these are all uh, measures that you can take to reduce your risk of abuse in this type of situation. Next slide. So we're going to be talking, as I said earlier, about managing performance remotely. Uh, next slide. So we, we, we just gave a few examples, one of them that uh, Alex referred to at the beginning. Uh, you might have seen some of these uh, very interesting, and I thought it was a nice introduction to talk about, you know, give just three examples of how Zoom can make it wrong. So one of the first thing was the Jeffrey Tubin case uh, at, the C at CNN that some of you might have heard of. So the guy, uh, you know, unwillingly uh, was caught masturbating during a Zoom web conference. Uh, and uh, his excuses were kind of uh, interesting uh, because he said that he didn't think that they could see him and he has muted, he had muted his Zoom presentation. So he thought he was fine. Um, you know, I thought I would have thought about different uh, explanations that might be uh, better for him. Um, the second one, a very funny one with, uh, with lawyers, you might see the cat below it. Uh, so this is actually a hearing taking place, uh, you know, by Zoom conference, where a filter was used by the lawyer. Uh, and you see basically, because you just see the picture of the cat, but the cat was actually speaking. So when the guy was speaking through his computer, the cat was kind of making uh, movements with his lips. So when he was talking, and actually, what was funny is, uh, he, he kept saying, as uh, Alex mentioned at the beginning, I am not a cat. And he also insisted that he was ready to proceed. Uh, obviously, that might have not been the case for the judge and the other lawyer. And the, first, the third one, which I, I, I thought, you know, is kind of a, something that happens, unfortunately, too frequently, uh, is your traditional nose digging uh, that you can sometimes find when people forget about uh, the fact that they're on Zoom conference. So more seriously, 
what's the main thing? Uh, we're going to skip to the next slide. Sorry, I forgot to mention it. So next, uh, so what we're going to be focusing on uh, during the uh, the presentation before going to performance, the, you know, the most the, the question that we we got the most was more about the dress code uh, for Zoom presentation. Obviously, as the pandemic was going on, some people were either you know kind of always closing their camera, uh, which was seen as kind of a lack of respect. Others were uh, wearing clothes that to, you should not be working, wearing when you're working. Um, so dress code was something that you'll want to cover uh, in, your, uh, in your work from home policy that I mentioned earlier. Coming back for performance, uh, many were worried at the beginning of the pandemic that performance would go down. Uh, because people were working from home, that they would all be doing their laundry, they would be cleaning dishes instead of, of working. Uh, you know, many of you probably know by now that it's probably the exact opposite at this point, that people have never been working so much. But, you know, you, you know they might, it, it might be the reality of the future. So what do we do to control uh, performance management? Uh, the first calls I, I started to get were about monitoring options or surveillance of employees when they're working from home. Uh, this is actually not a good option even at the workplace. So you can imagine when you're talking about monitoring or surveilling at home, uh, it's even worse because you're adding a layer of privacy. Uh, and actually, I, I kind of always reply to these questions by asking another question. Are you currently doing this? Uh, are you sitting behind the desk of your employees just to make sure they're working? Are you following them when they get take a coffee break just to make sure they take only 15 minutes? Uh, are you sure they're not going to the bank or something like that? Uh, so this was not the way you were you were. Um, you know, monitoring performance. So why would that change? Why can't you do the exact same thing when people are working from home? Maybe there's the aspect of work hours, but we've all heard about employees being present at work instead of working. So that, you know, so, so, so there's no reason to uh, not apply the same mechanism uh, when they're working from home. So how could you do this? First thing, and this could be in your in your uh, policy, but it could all be done also be done just by your supervisor and employees talking together and setting expectations. So making sure there are some uh, expectation about work hours. How many hours are employees supposed to work? Uh, do they still have breaks and lunch breaks? And how long are they? Uh, this is something that should be in your policy. I'm also mentioning this because this is going to be probably uh, one problem in the future over time. Make sure that your policy will cover how many hours uh, your employees are supposed to work and also how, how you, you want to handle overtime. If you don't want employees to be working overtime, assuming that it applies to, to these type of employees, make sure you have a provision that states that employees need prior authorization before uh, doing any overtime. Uh, we've seen in some recent cases that sometimes you know when you ask employees for some work that you know is taking a long time there's kind of, there could be an assumption that you're allowing overtime so make sure this this is going to be covered uh, what about blackout periods how, how will it be handled uh, there should be a process whereby you know employees are have to advise someone who is going to be in charge and tell them specifically what periods they will not be available uh, you know, what is non-negotiable? What are the exact hours of, of work that we're expecting at a minimum? You need to be available from that time to that time. This is something that should be set out either in the procedure, in the policy, or it should be set out that in your um, uh, on your one by one with the supervisor and the employee. Flexibility is also something that could be uh, that could be covered. Response time for for emails and, and deadlines. This is something I would probably uh, suggest be assume be, be be managed by the supervisor and the employees directly because it's hard to set up specific response time when you don't exactly know what the employees are working on or having a general rules on this. But this is one way. Just looking and monitoring response time is one way to see you know, whether your employees are working as you're suspecting or not. Uh, and this might give you a chance to ask questions. Provide for regular check-ins as well, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, weekly end of the day. There's two reasons for that. First one is mental health. Uh, you know, making sure your employees are safe. One of the sad thing about the pandemic is I've never seen that many employers asking me, should I call the police? Uh, 
uh, because they were worried about their employees. I actually, you know, it, it seems uh, like a, it might seem like a weird question, but actually it just me, I had at least four cases where my clients sent the police just to make sure the employee hadn't committed suicide. So obviously having regular check-ins is one way to just monitor mental health, making sure your employees are, are okay. It can also be a good thing, by the way, from a pure human resources retention uh, aspect, um, you know, keeping employees during the pandemic has been tough because obviously you're not creating the same uh, length between the employee and the organization. So your one-on-one -on -one could go a long way towards this. Coming back to performance, this is one way to talk with them and, and do it, you know, regularly and ask, you know, what have you been doing? What are you working on? When do you expect to complete? This is another way to manage performance, just like you would do it uh, if they were working uh, in the workplace. Set goals for the day or, uh, or the week and explanation and, and ask for explanation if it's not respected. Um, make provide, you know, make sure um, again during it could be during these check ins or otherwise uh, ensure physical safety and use uh, the use of company property as well is something that you might want to uh, address. Um, next slide. Coming back to time theft uh, or, or, or time management, I'm just gonna go uh, on, on some of the uh, glaring issues of managing, uh, you know, of time management for uh, employees working remotely in terms of, you know, because employees have been working outside of their regular hours. Uh, but actually we're focusing on this because people are working remotely, but this is the same situation for all employees who didn't really have like a, a, a standard schedule that they needed to be on. I just, I remember a case uh, a few years back where an employee who was a sales representative uh, used to like to go uh, play golf on Thursday afternoons and the employer was so bothered by this. Uh, but at the end of the day, if the employee in question had no set working hours and was playing golf in the afternoon and then at night he was preparing the presentation for five hours for the next morning and he was doing his job why would you be bothered by the fact that he was playing golf uh and actually when you know when you start asking questions you find out that this is an employee who was not performing in the first place so it was not really a question of time theft it was more a question of managing uh, performance it's the same reality for employees working remotely, unless you set up specific um, expectations, goals, and, and, perform, and, and requirements, it's going to be tough to, to manage it from that pure time management uh, standpoint. Um, human rights consideration, I'm actually going to skip, uh, and we're going to be talking about it more in the, in the family status uh, section. Uh, just skip next, next slide. Uh, employee absenteeism, you have uh, the, the, the elements that should be considered uh, when, uh, when, uh, before applying uh, either administrative or disciplinary sanctions. You know, are, they, are the employees eligible to statutory leaves of absences? There are so many during the pandemic and there might be more uh, after, uh, mostly based on family, uh, you know, requirements or obligations um, that could have an impact. Um, we're going to skip to the next slide because I'm going to be talking quickly about legitimate refusals of unsafe work. You're all probably aware of work refusals um, provisions. Um, I'm just going to, if you allow me, just maybe one additional minute and I'm going to complete that section. Um, so legitimate refusals of unsafe work. Uh, this is something, unfortunately, uh, we don't want to use too, too frequently, but during the, uh, the crisis, we've seen many, many kind of uh, weird work refusals. The most recent one I've had is uh, the employee cannot work a wear a mask while he's at his workstation working alone uh, because of medical problems. Obviously, this was kind of a, a medical certificate prepared by a very uh, acceptable doctor uh, who wanted to help his patient. But uh, sometimes this is something you might have to think about, you know, whether using the work refusal process might be the best solution um, to ensuring that you're gonna be able to keep your standard company policy alive. So that will complete it for this section. Can skip to the next slide. Uh, next one again, next. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Stefan.
in keeping with the timetable, all I'm going to say about this slide is that studies have shown that for a long time, humans have been traveling to work for approximately an hour. And we've obviously saved that hour when we work from home. But more recent studies show that we now spend 48 hours on average more per day connected. So the employers have, have scored that and we've only gained 12 minutes as employees. And I say that because in South Africa, the employers were also initially worried about productivity and whether the employees will be attending to the work as they should. Next slide, please. We have not found, in terms of the advice that we've had to give in South Africa, a correlation between poor performance and remote work. If anything, employees have work, worked harder, those who've uh, worked from home, probably driven by considerations about keeping their jobs and, and being concerned about their job security. The South African economy has been hit particularly hard um, by COVID, and we have seen lots of retrenchments. We've had employers, especially in the early stages, um, implementing certain measures. I'm not going to repeat all those measures. Many or most of them have been mentioned by Stefan, but it's basically about using platforms, um, check-ins, regular meetings, and the like. We've had the few that's taken the route of technology, um, keystrokes or being online. We've also had innovative employees working out that if you just tap the space bar, that uh, it still records that you being online. We don't think these intrusive checking uh, approach is very helpful and employees will find ways to evade it anyway. If anything, our analysis is that we're drifting to a more outcomes-based environment. And again, Stefan has given us a number of examples of that. Um, and that will, we think, increasingly, both from a legal perspective, um, but also from a practical perspective in terms of job descriptions, KPIs, require a rethink in the HR field as to how you measure and how you assess and how you determine competencies, how you um, do your development discussions, what is important. Those things are shifting and uh, require some thinking going forward. Next slide. Family status is the next we're going to be dealing with. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about family status accommodations. So this section is, is kind of a confluence of what we've been talking about already, which is essentially you know, what happens now that we've been working from home and that the more melding that there's been between home life and family life and what rights do employees have um, where they have obligations relating to their family. Because of course we know that it's not just employees who are working from home, but we're dealing with school closures and daycare closures and different families who are having different types of uh, responsibilities and, and, and their employers are allowing them to have different control over their work life balance. And essentially, there are two routes that we have to look at when we're dealing with family status uh, obligations. The first is that there are existing statutory leaves under employment standards legislation. This provides set periods of time that employees are able to be off from work uh, where they have childcare responsibilities. And the second thing we have is a duty to accommodate for family status under human rights legislation, which is a bit more difficult and a bit more nuanced. In terms of existing statutory leaves, there's been a lot of new leaves that have happened uh, that have been introduced by governments across Canada in order to account for uh, the, the issues that have arisen with COVID. Uh, specifically here in Alberta, there is a COVID emergency leave which allows employees to be off work if they become sick or if an immediate family member has become sick with COVID and they have to care for them. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a family responsibility leave, which allows employees uh, 
an unpaid leave of absence for time that they're that they have to be off work for which it's necessary for them to look after um, either ill family members or children because of daycare or school closures. There are similar leaves across Canada in this regard, specifically in Ontario, there are family responsibility leaves, a family caregiver leaves, family medical leave, and each one has different requirements. So the first step to look at when an employee is coming to you to say they have to, they are at or requesting to be off work because of, an, because of a childcare or a family responsibility is to determine if they're entitled to this leave, generally unpaid under employment standards legislation and determine what the criteria is for that leave and how long it is. The next step is to consider if there's not a specific leave or a specific criteria, or if the employee doesn't specifically fall into one of the criteria, is to consider if there is a duty to accommodate the employee's family status under human rights legislation. Yeah. In the majority of provinces across Canada, family status is a protected ground that for which employers are not permitted to discriminate employees on. So that means that if there's been a change to a term of employment uh, and it's had an adverse effect on on uh, the employee's ability to care for their family or their responsibility, that's going to trigger um, a, a a duty to accommodate and an analysis that has to be undertaken in order to determine whether accommodation is possible. And each issue and each step, each case is, is dealt with on a case by case basis. And to further complicate the issue in Canada is that in, in all of the provinces that have family status is that there are different tests for when an employee is entitled uh, to it or when an employer has to accommodate. Specifically under the Federal uh, Human Rights Act and the British Columbia Human Rights Code, there's a higher level um, that an employee has to have an interference with their family responsibilities before a duty to accommodate is triggered. Uh, specifically in, in those jurisdictions, there has to be a serious interference. So that means that any change has to result in a serious interference with their ability to care for their family or, uh, or members of their family. And these employees have to make a reasonable effort to try to mitigate that before they, um, before a duty to accommodate is triggered. Whereas in Alberta, there's, there's no requirement to make a reasonable effort before a duty to accommodate is considered and you don't have to have a serious interference. It just has to be any kind of adverse effect of having a change to the terms of employment that triggers or that is a result of, um, or that interferes with the childcare or family responsibility. And so in each case, we're gonna to have to look at these on a case by case basis. And we have a couple examples on the next slide. The first is, you know, how is an employer supposed to respond to a number of these issues? So, for example, a child care accommodation. So how should an employer respond to employees affected by daycare and school closures? The first is to look at what the situation is. In terms of a duty to accommodate, there's a two-way street. You have to look at it's what's possible in the circumstances and what's reasonable in the circumstances. It's not always up to the employer to determine. The employee has to participate in the process. The, the first things to, that you can look into include whether or not it's possible to create a flexible schedule or allow the employee to take a temporary leave of absence. The other thing to look at is whether or not there's the potential that you can actually reduce working hours or change working hours. Um, further, you know, there is also uh, to consider whether or not you can tolerate occasional disruptions during remote work. As we've talked about, we've all likely had issues when we've been on calls with people where there's been uh, an, uh, an unexpected guest, either a, a family member in the background or a dog in the background or something that's going on. We've We've all come to the conclusion that we, we all have things going on outside of our work lives and, and COVID's make that a lot more clear now that with Zoom and with teleconferencing, we've been invited into our employees' homes. And so tolerating occasional disruption is something that's becoming the new norm. And then similar to this, there's also the potential to accommodate for these disruptions by modifying job duties, such as when employees are required to be present, whether or not they're, they can keep their, their cameras off while their children may be there, 
um, and whether or not there could be other ways to mitigate the effect that we might have children in the workplace, which is now these employees' homes. One of the more complicated issues is how to deal with sick or high-risk family members. One issue that we've dealt with a number of times is when an employee requests to work from home because they live with an at-risk family member. Now, in these cases, these are supposed to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, and the decision itself was likely going to determine the nature of what the family member's illness is, the employee's relationship to that family member, and what measures can be implemented in the workplace to, to prevent the risk of transmission of the virus. Um, ultimately, we're always going to want to err on the side of health and safety, and so it, but we also don't want, we also want to make sure that there are solid medical reasons for granting these types of accommodations. And so employees do have an ability to request uh, information from a doctor um, that corroborates or shows that uh, the employee working from home would help to mitigate the risk of transmission or on the contrary, working from home uh, may create an undue risk for the family member due to the nature of their illness. This also ties into having a COVID safety plan or a work from home policy where we can address some of these issues up front and what the steps are going to be for dealing with accommodation on a case by case basis. So go to the next slide and we will uh, have Paul talk about the South African perspective. Thank you. In South Africa, we have the concept of family responsibilities. It is a listed ground, as we call it, in our legislation. It really means that adverse treatment of employees as a result of the family responsibilities is prohibited discrimination. That's the starting point. Um, this right has been used to expand rights uh, in respect of medical aid for dependents, for example, uh, within the same-sex partnership in environment. Um, and more recently, the debates about caregivers and flexible hours. It's really about work flexibility as a means of reconciling work and fam family needs. What COVID brings to us is uh, questions around at-risk family members and childcare, um, especially because uh, the work obligations of employees and the timing of when schools are open during the uh, COVID uh, restrictions do not always coincide. Um, the whole concept of accommodation uh, is, as Andrew explained, is really the same or very similar in South African law. So the employer has to consider the, the reasons and if possible, uh, and if, if possible accommodate or if reasonable accommodation is possible, then, then do so. Um, however, in terms of our law, we do have the concept of inherent requirements of a job, and um, these rights may be limited should the inherent requirements of the job um, justify that. Um, and accommodation may, may not be expected of the employer. It may even go as far as um, terminating the the employee's employment, although there are strict rules applicable to those processes, based in, both in terms of process and in terms of substance. And that's the, the South African situation. Great. Thanks, Paul. So we're going to look now at the impacts of COVID-19 on termination entitlements. So one of the things to note is at least um, in most Canadian provinces, the effects of COVID haven't restricted an employer's ability to end the employment of an employee. Uh, there st employees are still able to terminate or dismiss employees as is necessary, both for business reasons and financial reasons, and, and also for uh, performance and reasons amounting to cause. The question is, what is an employee entitled to? And so we thought we'd take a, a little bit of time here just to kind of go over what the general basics are for entitlement and then talk about how COVID uh, may have affected that. In general, an employee is, employer is entitled to terminate an employee's employment for any reason um, 
provide, if there's no cause, provided they provide the employee with notice or pay in lieu of notice. And so the question always we have to look at is what notice is the employee owed? The first step is to look at what the statutory entitlements are. Each province has employment standards minimums that set up what the amount or what the uh, minimum amount of notice or pay in lieu uh, has to be provided. And in provinces such as Ontario and under the federal jurisdiction, there's also an additional entitlement to severance. On top of that, we have the common law, which dictates an amount of notice, which is called reasonable notice that employees are entitled to upon the termination of their employment. And the amount of reasonable notice is a case by case assessment um, that is done with looking at a, a few factors. And just as a quick reminder, those factors are generally considered to be the age of the employee, the length of service of the employee, the character and nature of the employee's employment, and the availability of alternative work. But as with anything, um, an employee has a duty to mitigate and to look for reemployment if their employment is terminated. And that's really where we see the effects of COVID-19 in this case is how the, duty, how the duty to mitigate has changed and what the amount of notice has been and what courts have been uh, awarding. Go to the next slide. And specifically in, in Quebec, we note that the, terminate, that the termination indemnity, the amount of pay in lieu that's supposed to be provided on termination is set out in statute or public order. And it can't be avoided uh, and con you can't contract out of it. One thing um, to, again, make you aware of is a, a recent case out of Ontario, which has had a lot of effect uh, in the employment law circles called Wakesdale and, and Swagen. And this case has had a, a big effect on a lot of Ontario employment agreements, um, but it, it can be boiled down in a nutshell to reminding employers that when we look at the two different aspects of notice that's entitled to, that employees may be entitled to the statutory uh, notice and the statutory requirements and the common law requirements that in drafting employment contracts, the principle is that under an employment contract, an employee and employer can agree to provide the employee with only minimum standards entitlements on termination, but you can't agree to provide any less. And if you do, a contract is going to be unenforceable. And the vexing issue is always dealing with how to make sure you, your contract clearly provides that employees going to be provided with their entitlements under employment standards legislation, but no more. And it can kind of get into some issues um, because there are different requirements in each of the different provinces. In particular, the issue in Wakesdale was the fact that there is a, a, a different threshold for, for essentially what is called termination for cause under the Employment Standards Act. And the the contract in that case didn't distinguish clearly between the common law threshold and the threshold under the Employment Standards Act. And so ultimately the court held that that termination clause was unenforceable because it relied on the definition of just cause at common law rather than the higher, um, higher level of cause under the, the act. Um, and so that's been a, wake up call for a lot of employers to remind, just as a reminder that an enforceable, the enforceability of a termination provision is only going to be as good as the contract that you have. And that if it in any way violates employment standards minimums, that it's not going to be enforceable. Next slide. Similarly, another case that has recently come up has dealt with the limiting loss of incentive payments. And this is always something that uh, comes up as an issue when an employee is terminated. Uh, at common law, the principle of pay in lieu of notice and damages for wrongful dismissal is, is that you're supposed to put the employee in the same position as they would be if they were actively employed or while they, uh, if they were given actual notice rather than pay in lieu of notice. And so there's always a question before the courts of what would the employee have been entitled to if they had remained employed? And an issue of contention often is things like bonuses, incentive payments, um, options, vesting, all, all of these items over and above salary, which is generally fairly easy to determine. 
the takeaway from the recent case from the Supreme Court, Matthews and Ocean Nutrition, is that an employer can exclude incentive payments and bonus payments that an employee may have been entitled to during a reasonable notice period, provided that the contract clearly and unambiguously removes an employee's right to common law damages for the loss of that incentive program. Uh, the issue in this case was that the policy said that the employee that the payment was only going to be made to an employee who is actively employed. Go to the next slide, please. But the definition of actively employed in this case wasn't sufficient enough to remove the employee's right to the LTIP payment because the question wasn't whether or not the employee was actively employed. The question was what the employee would have received had he remained employed with the company. And in this case, had he remained employed with the company during the period of notice, he would have received that LTIP payment. And so the definition of actively employed wasn't relevant to the court. The question is, what would he be entitled to? And the only way to remove that entitlement is to have put in language that says that you're that the employee was clearly and unambiguously not entitled to that payment as part of any common law damages for uh, wrongful dismissal or the failure to provide proper notice. So again, and looking at all of these things when we're dealing with, with terminations during COVID, um, the general principles still apply. And the question of an employee's entitlements are gonna come down to what does the contract say and what does the employment standards legislation say? And next slide, please. And similarly, one of the things that has come up um, to this point is an issue of force majeure, which I'll touch on briefly. At the beginning of COVID, there's been some question of whether or not contracts could be terminated for force majeure, essentially the idea that they're impossible to perform. A number of employees have tried to make this argument, although I have not seen yet any decisions that have um, ruled either way. Essentially, force majeure for, at this point is going to be very difficult to prove unless you can show that the contract of employment is impossible. So essentially, it means that there's no way that the employer and the employee can continue the employment relationship. Next slide, please. We'll talk to, and we'll have Paul jump in and, and give his South African perspective. Thank you, Andrew. So in South Africa, we do not have without cause termination and notice does not have the same significance. Our system works very differently. But the issue of terms and conditions of employment and how that or contractual terms and how that has been affected or would be affected by COVID certainly has been part of the legal aspects that we've had to deal with more so during the hard lockdown. Um, and in our system, the question about suspension of the employment contract or force majeure certainly came to the fore and that is applicable under levels four and five. Should we ever go back there? We've had a number of cases in respect of that. Initially, our advice to clients was certainly during the hard lockdown because it is a result of legislation and regulatory decisions that there is some sort of suspension of the employment contract. And that, of course, brought the debate about whether there was, in those circumstances, an obligation on the employer to pay the employees. Most of our clients who were not able to pay during those periods uh, took the avenue of putting the employees on leave that in itself has caused some conflict. To what degree are they entitled to, to do so? Certainly the cases, and maybe the, the most interesting one is that of an employer that unilaterally decided to reduce remuneration um, as an alternative to, to retrenchment, to restructuring and retrenchment due to financial difficulties experienced as a result of COVID. Um, that has gone to, to court. And now courts did not accept the suspension of the employment contract or the force majeure argument in respect of that particular case. It upheld the contractual provisions and the employee's contractual entitlement to be paid, paid remuneration in those circumstances. 
So in our jurisdiction, those arguments have not yet succeeded, although technically, depending on the set of facts, we certainly think that um, in certain circumstances that those will be acceptable. One has to keep in mind that in our system, our labor court is not only a court of law, but it's also a court of equity, which um, even in respect of contractual disputes, although it's debatable, um, one may find some equity creeping into some of the decisions. That's not entirely surprising, although it is debatable. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about notice in a minute. Um, Andrew is first just going to take us through some of the notice period aspects. That's great. Thank you, Paul. So when we're looking at notice periods during COVID, it's still a open question as to how COVID is going to affect common law notice periods. As I mentioned, there are a number of factors called the Barnell factors that a court generally considers. The first three haven't changed in COVID. They're, they are age, length of service, and the character of employment. But the last one is the availability of other employment. And we have lots of plaintiffs who are coming to court and arguing for an extended notice period because of the effects of COVID uh, on their ability to find a job. So far, we haven't had any cases in the common law provinces, BC, Alberta, Ontario, deal with what the exact effect of COVID is on notice period. But we have had some indications that it could be used as a factor to increase notice periods. Specifically, to start in the case of Yee v. Hudson, which was a recent Ontario case, we have the case of an employee who was terminated just before COVID started. And there was a question of, well, does he have an increased reasonable notice period because his notice period fell during or coincided with, with the occurrence of COVID and the start of COVID. And in this case, the court said no. And the reason for that is that reasonable notice and the amount of reasonable notice is determined at the time that notice is given. Because that's the time, if we're looking at what the damages are for, the damages are not for terminating someone's employment, the damages are for failing to give proper notice. And so the amount of notice has to be determinable at the time that that notice should have, was given or should have been given. In this case, the notice was provided before, the, before COVID had happened. And so it was not reasonably within the, the mind of the employer and the employee that, that, uh, that a longer notice period uh, should have been uh, granted. And so in this case, in the case of Mr. Yi, there was no there was no increase to the notice period because of uh, the effects of COVID. But at the same time, uh, we have to be mindful of some other cases, uh, specifically, I'll, I'll speak to two in Alberta, uh, that have recognized that an economic downturn can potentially increase notice periods. In Alberta, we've been dealing with an economic downturn for a few years now due to the collapse of the oil and gas sector. And we've had lots of, as a result of that, lots of dismissals and uh, lots of claims for reasonable notice. And in this case, in, in Alberta at least, the courts have held that a depressed economy uh, or a weakened economic sector can be used to increase reasonable notice periods. Um, so it is possible, and we expect that there will be decisions where uh, plaintiffs will have tried to make this argument, uh, relying on on these uh, uh, on cases where that have already recognized that a downturn in the economy could increase the notice period as a reason to increase the notice period during COVID. But one thing to point out is that the courts uh, in Alberta, at least that have looked at this point have determined that it's just one factor. It's not to be given an outsized presence. It's just supposed to be one thing that's supposed to be considered within the entirety of the analysis. So on this, we're still in a wait and see mode to determine whether or not uh, what the exact effect is gonna be on notice periods. Although there seems to be some indication that it could be used to increase notice periods, we are uh, still, we're mindful of the fact that it's gonna be one factor that's gonna be taken into consideration among others. I'll go to the next slide. And similarly in, in Quebec, uh, we haven't had any cases out yet, yet where it's being considered, um, but cases are being investigated. Um, and in, as just back to my point about it 
it's just one factor. There are some markets and there are some sectors that are still thriving. And so COVID in itself is not going to be able to be used um, in all circumstances as a reason to increase the notice period, especially if there's evidence that it hasn't had an outsized effect on the sector or the industry that that employer works in. So we'll go back to Paul to discuss the effects of notice in South Africa. So to conclude, in respect of South Africa, notice is a contractual issue. As long as the contractual notice period complies with the minimum requirements of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, it remains a purely contractual question and doesn't result in the same litigation as you would find in, in Canada. The key issue in South Africa is whether dismissal is fair or unfair. And in respect of all terminations of employment, you do need a fair reason and you need to have followed a fair procedure. The fair procedure is determined by the reason. So you would have typically a consultation process in respect of operation requirements or retrenchments. And in respect of misconduct, you would have to follow a fair disciplinary process. These two operational requirements and misconduct are also the two areas or the two types of terminations or reasons for termination that would be most closely connected to the consequences of COVID-19. Operational requirements obviously linking to the economic consequences of COVID-19. And there we have certainly in our country have had most extraordinary circumstances. It is the first time in my career that trade unions have opted and encouraged and in, was in favor of going the route of retrenchments as opposed to, for example, opting for a layoff where the employees do not lose their work, but it's only not paid for a, for a certain period. Um, that, I think, emphasized the anxiety about um, companies going under and so forth. Um, the principles around termination and dismissal in the South African environment remains the same. And the consequence, if you get it wrong, also remains the same. Uh, it could result in reinstatement. And if you're looking at compensation um, as an alternative to reinstatement, you are looking at 12 or 25 months uh, remuneration as, as compensation, and those are the caps, the maximums. So I think it's time to talk about vaccines. Thanks, Paul. So obviously, uh, as we've said from the beginning, you know, COVID-19 is an evolving situation. And since we started our seminar an hour ago, just over an hour ago, we've now learned that the stay at Home order in Ontario has been lifted as of Monday uh, in Toronto Peel and uh, the um, uh, North Bay uh, Perry Sound uh, region. So we're uh, we're not sure yet if we're moving into which of the five colored stages, but we expect it'll be in the gray one. And also, since we've started our seminar, uh, we've seen that Johnson and Johnson has been announced as the fourth vaccine to be approved here in Canada which leads us perfectly to the end of our seminar about what are those vaccines and why is that gonna impact our analysis? If we could move to the next slide. So obviously, you know, when we started talking about the impacts of COVID from the beginning, we've had certain legal requirements that we've always applied. And one of those has been that, it, you know, generally employers don't have the right to interfere or intrude an employee's medical decisions and how they want to deal with medical decisions. And if you had asked me at the beginning of COVID whether or not we would be able to do temperature checks, I would have said uh, not really likely. And we've seen obviously that evolved and, and people are regularly doing temperature checks in, in a variety of industries and workplaces. And we've seen that people have adjusted to that. So right now, we don't have any uh, case law that supports a mandatory vaccine uh, campaign that would support employers putting in a mandatory vaccine policy. Uh, we don't have governments supporting that right now. We've seen that both Ontario and BC have put out notices saying that they're going to be encouraging voluntary vaccinations as opposed to mandatory. But again, we may see that evolve with time. So when we think about what is the law and how it would apply, 
I mean, we typically refer to some of the influenza decisions that we've seen in the unionized environment, which is really the best basis we have to understand how, how arbitrators and decisions maker, decision makers will look at this issue. And it's all across, uh, if you look across the country, we have different decisions, right? We have uh, decisions in, um, in um, BC, which have upheld uh, vaccine uh, influenza policies, or that you have to wear a mask um, as being a reasonable policy for an employer to have. And we've seen that actually in Quebec as well. But in Ontario, we've seen at least two decisions where they have found that policies of those nature are unreasonable. So it's really, you know, a, an evolving situation to see whether or not um, without the government mandating uh, vaccinations, whether employers will be able to put in such policies. And we think there may be some appetite for it, certainly in certain industries. We think about healthcare in particular, or those industries that deal with vulnerable populations. We may see some movement in regulations under the public health legislation in various, um, in various provinces. You know, we have seen, interestingly enough, um, there is exist under the Ontario Ambulance Act right now, paramedics are required to be immunized. So it's not that there hasn't been some, you know, ind you know individual movements in this regard in the, in the past, but a broad-based mandatory policy is something that uh, we're not sure is actually going to happen. The other thing that I thought was interesting for people who are operating in Ontario is, you know, what happens if people refuse to uh, vaccinate themselves and um, they don't come to work? The Employment Standards Guide has currently said that if people are non-complying with a vaccination program, they may be entitled to the infectious disease emergency leave that was put in during COVID, and therefore they'd be on an unpaid leave in accordance with the employment standards legislation. So where does that leave employers? I mean, basically, and you know, and Stefan and, and Paul can jump in after me to maybe give a different context. Well, what that leaves us with is really looking at how do we encourage vaccinations in the workplace? And that seems to be a lot of where my clients are saying to me, you know, maybe how do we do that? How do we incentivize people to do it? And then how do we incentivize employees to actually disclose to us that they've had the vaccination through a proper record of some kind. And we don't know those answers right now. We don't know what records people will have, but there is some indication that they will want to track some paper copies, certainly for travel purposes. So, you know, incentivizing employees can come up in a couple of ways. One is obviously paying employees for the time off work so they can go and get vaccinated. Recently, I've had some employers say they'd be willing to pay up to three hours of pay time to allow employees to go and get the vaccination. Um, other you know, employees have said, what happens if we give a bonus of some kind? And that's a re really interesting question. I saw recently that the, EO the EEOC in the United States has not answered that question concretely as to whether or not if you pay certain people because they're willing to get vaccinated, is there a discriminatory claim against those employees who are saying they can't get vaccinated for religious or health reasons. And so whether or not that will create some discrimination claims remains to be seen. But interestingly enough, we did see that in the last week or so that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has put out a position, I would say a tweet in fact, that says that a singular belief or personal preference against vaccinations or masks does not appear to be protected by the ground of creed or religion under the code. So, I mean, we're definitely seeing um, some movement in ways that we have not seen before. Um, I'd be interested to hear from Paul about what the South African context is. And then obviously, Stefan will end it up from his perspective as well. And on a final note, I would say, you know, Ontario doesn't have privacy legislation in place right now. But certainly in Quebec and BC and Alberta, there are privacy legislation. So employees should keep top of mind that personal records and medical information of employees will have to be in compliance with those legislation. But I'd like to open it up at this point to Paul and then Stefan to talk about um, vaccinations from their uh, perspective. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alex. In South Africa, the right to bodily integrity flows from our constitution. And certainly the legal fraternity um, are not all of the same mind um, from employers uh, 
there is definitely interrogation into whether they would be entitled to compel employees to um, undergo vaccination. Our view is that our constitution will probably trump that and for now not allow employers to do so. Also under our employment equity legislation, there are limitations in respect of um, medical processes that one will have to take into consideration. The idea of incentives has also come to the fore in the South African environment. We have some case law around bonuses in certain circumstances, not exactly the same, but certainly we, we have some uh, similar situations in the past where the courts have struck down and it did go to either unfair labor practice or discriminatory uh, measures uh, by the employers. So we see difficulty for now, so, uh, South African employers enforcing any sort of um, vaccination requirements. As I've said earlier, we are a long, long way away from vaccines being generally available to South Africans in any event. We have only just begun to roll it out uh, and then only for certain healthcare workers. So we could be at least months, if not a year or more away from that debate in any event. Um, my sense is if we get close to a portion, a big enough portion of the population being vac vaccinated, then um, our regulators may very well uh, enter this debate and, and settle it from a legislative point of view, if it's in the interest generally of the economy and and safety or health um, in our country. Thanks, Paul. I think, Stefan, we have a question that you could end us with. And before uh, we end, I would just uh, say to all those attending that we actually have an upcoming seminar at the end of the month on March 31st uh, on a full deep dive into the issues of vaccinations for an hour and a half. But one of the questions that's come from uh, Jeff Golub is um, in the healthcare context, Stefan, uh, pre-COVID, um, his understanding was that some employees have encouraged employees to get seasonal flu vaccines. And if they do not, they cannot have direct patient contact unless they're willing full protective PPE, masks, et cetera. I, I have not seen that personally uh, in Quebec, at least. We saw that, you know, as you mentioned, when uh, uh, we were talking about the uh, avian flu a couple of years back. Uh, and, and at the time, it was in the healthcare environment, and they were actually uh, asking people to asking uh, uh, nurses who refused to get the vaccine to stay home. Uh, you know, at least during the uh, while the crisis was going on. I haven't seen. You know, obviously, this can only go for for so for, for so long. I think it's probably a good alternative to just say, you know, you're going to have to wear a mask. At least you have a, an alternative. Uh, to that. I just wanted to make two other comments to uh, before we complete. Uh, first one about, you know, the right to require vaccines uh, in Quebec. We've already been asked that question several times, uh, just like in other provinces, I would assume uh, we have the protection, protection of physical integrity that's in the uh, Charter of Human Rights. Uh, it can also, you know, obviously be uh, there could be exceptions, but exceptions needs to be uh, to be justified, uh, both in terms of uh, you know the the the, um, uh, the impact on, on clients, for example, uh, and the existence or not of other means. Uh, here, at least, even in the hospital sector, the government is not requiring uh, hospital staff to be vaccinated. So, as I told my clients. Good luck trying to convince an arbitrator or a judge that in your particular area, just like in here, let's say in the mining industry, that it's so important that you should be vaccinated, even if it's not required in the healthcare environment. So that's that was my first uh, response to that. That is why there's so many incentives uh, program being considered, because that's another way to get people to get vaccinated. One last comment about the religious uh, aspect or, or probably justification to refuse a vaccine. I actually had to conduct a, a very interesting research on how many religions were uh, against vaccination. And uh, be careful when you think about that, because there aren't many, actually, uh, at least that we know of. When you, when you do some research, you find out that it's not as, as bad as you would think. Um, so that's my two comments.
Oh, thanks very much, Stefan. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. We're at the end of our session. Uh, thanks to all the panelists uh, for participating with me, and we hope you have a great weekend. Thanks very much.